Welcome to the Terran Space Academy. This lesson is one of a series to make you familiar with the space programs of nations around the world. Today we will be looking at the ancient nation of India. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help support us on Patreon if you can. The culture of modern India started in the Indus Valley, seen here. The Indus Valley is an incredibly beautiful place. A Bronze Age civilization rose there as early as 3300 BCE. But agricultural civilizations existed as far back as 6500 BCE, making it one of the oldest centers of humanity in the world. The area controlled by this civilization was larger than its contemporaries in Egypt and Mesopotamia, stretching all the way from Afghanistan through Pakistan and much of modern India. Like the Egyptian Nile and the Babylonian Euphrates, the Indus civilization flourished in the basin of a massive river system, in this case, the Gagarhakra River. This civilization has left the remains of over 1,000 major settlements that have been uncovered. The most ancient Indus writing system has not yet been deciphered, but we know that they had urban planning, brick homes, drainage systems, water systems, and advanced metallurgy. In fact, alloys were used to make medical instruments almost indistinguishable from what we use today. Indus Valley medicine was probably the best in the world at that time. Over thousands of years, this civilization developed into the Hindu belief system, which persists today in modern India. India is the second most populous nation on Earth, and now has multiple cultures comprising 28 states and 8 territories. Indian culture has valued learning and adapted quickly to the development of science. The Indian Space Research Organization is responsible for India's space program. ISRO was developed from Incospar in 1962 by Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. Here you can see its place in the organizational structure of the Indian government under the Department of Space. Dr. Sarabhai recognized the need for space technology and research, and ISRO quickly made its first satellite. The Aryabhata, named for a 5th century Indian astronomer seen here which was launched by the Soviet Union in 1975, as you see commemorated on this stamp. Please note that instead of politicians on all their money, India has its first satellite, seen here, on a two rupee bill. The satellite conducted experiments in X-ray astronomy and solar physics for five days. Since this satellite had been launched on a Soviet rocket, India decided it needed its own launch systems and built its first satellite launch vehicle, or SLV. The SLV program was started in the 1970s with the goal of reaching a 400 kilometer orbit with a payload of up to 40 kilograms. This first rocket was a 22 meter tall, 1 meter in diameter, 17 ton, 4 stage solid rocket propellant system. The first successful flight was with SLV-3 in July 1980, which launched the 35 kilogram RS-1 into low earth orbit. The SLV-3 was followed by the ASLV, or Augmented Satellite Launch Vehicle, which was used to place a 113 kilogram payload into a 400 kilometer low Earth orbit. This was a five-stage solid propellant rocket with a height of 23.5 meters and a diameter of 1 meter, and a total mass of 41 tons. ISRO continued perfecting its rockets, switching to more efficient liquid propellant for some stages, and producing the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, which you see here. This is a four-stage rocket with a booster system. The first stage is still solid propellant, with a mass of 138 tons and a thrust of 4,847 kilonewtons. The second stage is a 42-ton liquid-fueled system using one VCOS engine. The VCOS is a gas generator rocket engine like the Merlin, but it burns nitrogen tetroxide and unsymmetric dimethyl hydrazine, producing 804 kilonewtons of thrust at 293 seconds of specific impulse. This is similar to some of the early Soviet rocket engines. The third stage is a solid rocket motor burning HTPB or hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene. This propellant is also used on the Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 where it burns with nitrous oxide. The fourth stage has a propellant mass of 2.5 tons and burns monomethyl hydrazine and mixed oxides of nitrogen through two regeneratively cooled engines that gimbal and produce 7.4 kilonewtons each. This rocket system can have two, four, or six boosters depending on the mission requirements. Each booster is a 12 meter tall, 1 meter in diameter solid rocket HTPB motor with a propellant mass of 12 tons, producing 703.5 kilonewtons each with a specific impulse of 262 seconds. Improved variants of this rocket are still in use and it's launched from the Dawan Space Center and is used to put about 1,800 kilograms into a polar sun synchronous orbit. Being in a polar orbit allows the satellite to map the entire Earth over time, 
and sun synchronous means it passes over the area it is scanning at the same relative time each day. The ISRO also developed this much more powerful rocket. This is the geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle. It is 49 meters tall, 2.8 meters in diameter, with a mass of almost 415 tons. It has three stages and can get 5,000 kilograms to lower Earth orbit or 2,700 kilograms to geosynchronous transfer orbit. This rocket can have four boosters about 20 meters long and 2 meters in diameter with a propellant mass of 42 tons. Each booster is burning nitrogen tetroxide and UDMH through two VCOS L40H engines. The first stage uses the S-139 solid rocket motor with a mass of 138 tons, burning HTPB at 4,847 kilonewtons. This is the same first stage used on the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle. The second stage has 39.5 tons of hypergolic propellant to burn through one GS-2 VCOS-4 engine. The third stage of the GSLV is much different than that of the PSLV, though. The GSLV uses a liquid hydrogen third stage burning through a CE 7.5 engine. The CE 7.5 is part of the indigenous cryogenic upper stage system and is a staged combustion engine, producing a thrust of 73.5 kilonewtons at 454 seconds specific impulse. The efficiency of this stage is a big part of the GSLV's capabilities. This rocket has gone through several upgrades, including the GSLV-3 seen here. The GSLV-3 has an updated booster system using two S-200 solid rocket motors burning HTPB with a thrust of 5,150 kilonewtons at 275 seconds specific impulse. These are considered the first stage. The second stage is a 125-ton hypergolic system burning NTO and UDMH through two VCOS engines. The third stage is an advanced 33-ton system using the CE-20 gas generator hydrogen-fueled rocket engine producing 200 kilonewtons of thrust at up to 445 seconds of specific impulse. This system can place up to 10,000 kilograms in a low Earth orbit or 4,000 kilograms in a geosynchronous transfer orbit. This is the most powerful rocket that India flies and is comparable to the Chinese Long March 7, but it is not yet as capable as the SpaceX Falcon 9 or the Ariane 5 rocket system. On the 1st of July, 2020, ISRO announced their intention to develop a manned spaceflight program. India has been developing the Gaganyaan, or Sky Vehicle. I probably pronounced that terribly. This vehicle would allow up to three crew members to orbit Earth for up to a week. The Indian astronauts will train in Russia. The Gaganyaan is a 5.3 ton capsule that started development in 2008. It has a 2.9 ton service module powered by liquid propellant. Together, these comprise the orbital module. The capsule was successfully re-entry tested in 2014 when it launched on a GSLV-3 rocket. The launch abort system was tested in 2018 with no problems. The first orbital test is planned for December 2021 with a second unmanned test in 2022. A crewed orbital flight is expected in 2023. The ISRO has also carried out robotic space exploration missions. India has become a master of software and electronic design. One of its space projects was the Chandrayaan-1. This was a combined lunar orbiter and impactor system. It was launched in October 2008 and operated until August 2009. It was launched on a polar satellite launch vehicle and helped map the lunar surface. The impact probe struck the moon's south pole on 14 November 2008 near Shackleton Crater. This probe ejected subsurface soil and was able to detect lunar water ice. This confirmed the water ice detected by the NASA Moon Mineralogy Mapper which had been on the Chandrayaan-1 and was announced on 24 September 2009. The importance of this discovery cannot be overstated. Finding water on the moon changes everything for moon colonization. Chandrayaan-2 was the second lunar exploration mission by India and consisted of an orbiter, lander, and rover. The spacecraft was launched in July of 2019 on a GSLV Mark III. It started orbiting the moon in August and dispatched the Vikram lander, seen here. There was supposed to be a soft landing near the lunar south pole, and the Vikram lander would release the Pragyan rover. Sadly, the lander deviated from its trajectory and suffered litho breaking. You can see the debris here, due to a software error. The Chandrayaan-3 is being prepared for 2022 to try again. India may later have manned lunar ambitions, if they can develop a more powerful launch system. Getting humans to the moon will not be possible without a heavier lift vehicle. But India has lots of brilliant people and is easily capable of having a bright future in space and competing with any other nation. India has also been developing this robotic system. Robots, either autonomous or remotely controlled, 
are an incredibly good option for lunar colonization. These systems can be sent to the moon with a lot less complexity than sending human beings and they can be used to build the infrastructure needed to support human colonization. Let's wish India and the ISRO the best of luck in their endeavors. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and stay safe at Astro Proterra.